Hello, my friends. Thank you for joining me. I am so glad to have you with me for our continuing study in Catholicism and the Antichrist. Please don't forget the ground rules. If you want to be credible, quote God. If you're unsure as to how to respond to something I say, quote God. Because that's the only thing that's going to really be credible with me is the words of God, which leads us directly into the study tonight with regards to the Antichrist, anti anti-Christ, and what Catholicism does. And we're going to find in tonight's lesson one of the most vivid illustrations of how they, they justify through very subtlety, uh, subtle terms and, and subtle actions and su more, more so subtle interpretations or manipulations of interpretations. And, and they, they manipulate things to make it sound really religious, really good, as if they have the right to speak for God. And uh, as you're going to see this evening in tonight's lesson, we're going to deal with some things that are hugely important with regards to establish, establishing authority. And the reason they're important is because from this point on, we really have to look at some issues that uh, the Catholic Church presents to the world and then compare them to something. They would have us say, because we do it, it's got to be right. I would have us understand that, no, the Catholic Church isn't the end all as far as truth is concerned. And as we've already established, they didn't give us our Bible. They are not the ones who have some kind of extra special authority as far as apostolic succession is concerned. But, on the, but rather, we should say that God himself is big enough to be able to speak for himself, defend himself, explain himself, etc. So, anyhow, thank you for being with me tonight. As you're going to see, this will be a rather interesting topic that we're going to cover tonight. But before we go there, as always, let's deal with the five questions. Here are the questions if you're part of the Restoration School of Biblical Studies. Those will be on your final test that you receive in the email on Friday. If you're not part of the School of Biblical Studies, my first question is why. But uh, my second question is, what will you do with these questions? Uh, I would suggest that you take them, use them for your own personal Bible study. And even if the, at the end of this particular lesson, you do not come out the other end uh, concluding the same things that I conclude, at the very least, you're going to see a lot of Bible and you're going to hear what God has to say about things. And you and I have got to come to a, a point where we either say God gets the final word or I get the final word. And that's really what this lesson is all about. And so as you study these particular right there it is. As you study these particular uh, five questions, do so with the point of view of, I want to I want to know what God thinks, because that's the thing that is most important here. All right, here we go, folks. Are you ready? All right. Tonight's question that we're going to deal with, is God's word enough? Sola Scriptura. Uh, you see there that that screen that I showed you last time, but uh, I wanted to add another term because the Catholic Church is so very, very good at this. They, they like to take either big terms or Latin terms, use them as if they are the only ones who really know stuff. And I, on many occasions, I've had them as they've debated with me. They almost break into a different language. I guess that's what Latin is. But they, they break into this different language as like they're going to impress me or intimidate me, make me go away because, oh dear, they used a Latin word and I can't be smart as they are. Nonsense. If you will study these terms, one of the first things you're going to find is that most of them don't even appear in the Bible. They're terms they made up for concepts that they made up about biblical things. But beyond that, you're going to find that even the terms that they present to us, if you just take a moment, you can easily define them. And I've got a list of them there for you, the Eucharist, Transubstantiation, Immaculate Conception, etc. But we dealt with those last time, so I'm not going to go back through that list. Go back and see the previous lesson if you're interested in those. But I want you to go to the very tail end there and notice we've added another one, and that's Sola Scriptura. Uh, again, a Latin phrase. This idea that the scriptures are the sole infallible source of the Christian faith and practice. Now, this is an interesting phrase or combination of terms because they don't believe this. These terms are used, again, to intimidate us, to suggest by using these, the, these big, flowery, oh, I wonder what that means, terms. They are supposed to corner us, put us in a box, and suggest that, see there, you don't know what you, you should uh, if you're challenging the Catholic Church. We do, I do, I hope that you do, think that God is enough. 
He doesn't need the Catholic Church. He doesn't need Sonny Childs to explain. Now, I'm not suggesting that he doesn't on occasion use humanity. That's what we have evangelists for, to give explanations, etc. But their explanations are not the final word. Absolutely not the final. Even Paul, the one who writes almost three, well, two-thirds of our New Testament, even Paul was checked by Scripture. Remember, the Bereans were more noble than those of Thessalonica because they, they searched the Scripture daily to see if what Paul was saying was actually true. Even the Apostle Paul needed to be checked by Scripture. So what does that tell you? With regards to apostolic succession, which we dealt with last time, with regards to Peter, uh, who was their supposed first pope, with regards to any man, even an inspired individual, gets checked by the previous inspired information that has been presented. And so it should tell us that even if there is an area for church tradition to have a level of authority in our life, it isn't the top one, and it's certainly not one that rivals Scripture, even though they would conclude that it is. Bottom right-hand corner, I just think this is a powerful point to be made again. You know, when they use these fancy terms, it's kind of like the difference between a work truck and a big boy toy. Here in Northeast Arkansas, you can tell the guys who are working in the field, and you can tell the guys who just drive it to church on Sunday morning all shined up because they want to, I guess, act like that they're some kind of something. It's kind of like the difference between home cooking and going to a swanky restaurant, you know, and you pay a bunch of money for just a little piece of meat or whatever it may be. Come to my mom's house, and you're going to, you know, big old portions, etc. It's kind of like the difference between a personal conversation and a scripted lecture. You know what I'm saying? When they use these big terms... It's very impersonal. It's like it takes us off into a mechanized system of Christianity. We need to get back to the heart of things, recognizing that our Jesus looked nothing like their Pope of present day. Their Pope with the funny hat and the long dress and living in opulence and, and all that. Kind of, it looks He looks nothing like, and yet he's supposed to be the representative of Jesus on earth? I don't think so. Well, they take that blasphemy and they extend it all the way to the authority of Scripture. And in the next slide, I'm going to show you a, a diagram of what one Catholic sent to me, trying to explain to me how they establish authority within the Catholic Church. Let's just go there so we can get it there up in front of you, and you can see it. Oops. Uh, I'll come back to this. Let's see if it's the next one. There it is. See that one? That's the that's the uh, what do you what do I call that diagram? We'll come back to that. But let me let me I, I got so fast. You get me so excited. I, I anyhow. All right, here we go. Is God's words enough? Yes, absolutely. We're going to take this in two parts because it is so important to the rest of this series. First part tonight, trusting God. Second part next time, trusting God to explain Himself. Notice how we did that. So you trust God to deliver, and you trust God to explain. And at the end of the process, guess what you got? God. If, on the other hand, you don't trust God to deliver because the Catholic Church had to put your Bible together, you don't trust God to explain because the Catholic Church has to tell you what it means, at the end of the day, what do you got? The Catholic Church. And I ain't interested. I want to know what God has to say. So, tonight, part one, trusting God. Now, to that slide I wanted you to see. This Catholic presented me with uh, this diagram of the Catholic Church, and uh, very sincere, trying to represent how they, they and, you know, you notice you got three legs to the stool, because a three-legged stool is more stable than even a four-legged stool, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But what you have here is they're trying, to, they're trying to suggest that the Catholic Church is more stable, because we have on the left, that another big word there. It just has to do with the hierarchy of the Catholic Church, the priests, etc., etc., cardinals, blah, blah, blah. And then to the far right, sacred tradition. That would be church tradition. It's sacred because the church that they believe is the accurate church, they're the ones who came up with, they invented it, therefore it has to be sacred. You know, you see how that works? I made it up, therefore it has to be right. You, can't, you just can't reason that way. But before I go to the bottom right-hand corner, let me take you to the passage here at the top. 2 Timothy 4, verse 3. For the time is coming, and I would suggest to you we're living in it now, but the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching. That is, there are certain things they don't want to hear. My ministry has suffered a lot under the persecution of this particular principle, even within the restoration movement. I've talked a lot about the importance for us not to invest so much money in a building that sits empty for the majority of the week, while we've got missionaries who are working with 
third-hand equipment. It's just not right. I, pr I preached on the fact that Titus chapter 2 is a command when it tells that women should be homemakers and that they should be in charge of the home and, and they should train their children, etc. I've done a lot of that and it's really I've had a lot of pushback because even from folks within the restoration movement, they don't want to endure sound teaching, stuff that comes straight from God. Continue in our passage. They don't want to endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions i going to make a confession here just real quickly. I've spent the majority of my ministry, and I've been in ministry for 40 years now, but I've spent the majority of my ministry tickling ears. I'm really good at telling stories, making people laugh and cry in the next minute, etc. And I can bring you to a rousing climax. And I, I am absolutely confident that many of the folks who have responded to the invitation at the end of one of my lessons have often done so driven more out of emotion than true rationalization of their condition with respect to who God is. And I'm ashamed of that. I, I, I truly am. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with telling stories. Jesus was obviously the master teller, tr uh, storyteller. But I am saying that when it's the story rather than the principle that really takes root in your heart, then you, you've gone away with something that's entertaining, but it's not something that's life-changing. Teachers to suit their own passions. I find this to be true in most of the churches that I have associated myself with over the years, and even present tense, that so often people are more, inter they're more interested in being entertained, their own passions, than they are actually hearing what God has to say. And of course, we use a lot of things. People will talk about the, the praise band. Well, that, it's just too entertaining. Or, you know, they'll talk about, you know, whatever. And they go through, we don't want to use gimmicks to get God, to get people into God, to come to God, etc. They'll go all through that list while at the same time being guilty of the very things that they're condemning. I ask you to be very personal with yourself at this particular moment. What are you most interested in when you come to this particular lesson? If you're a Catholic, a loyal, dedicated Catholic, you're listening to this, you're offended before you ever get started. You're already saying Sonny Childs is a false teacher. You've dismissed what I have said and what I'm going to say right out the gate. And the sad part of that is you've done it in spite of the fact that I have already listed a passage on the scripture, or a passage on the screen, where it's scripture from, straight from the heart of God. You're going to see many more as we continue in this lesson. That's the sad part. And when you see it, it makes you, forces you to look into the mirror and recognize you're wrong, you so often will, instead of making changes in your life, you will argue that, well, that's just your personal interpretation, Sonny. Anything that you can do to dismiss the application. On the other hand, there may be some of you who are listening, who actually have a sincere heart, and you are willing, and as I pray almost daily, God, help me to see what you want me to see. Help me I pray this regularly with God. Don't let me fool myself into thinking. I want what you want, God. I mean, after all, he's the one who allows my heart to continue to beat. And I can draw in a breath because he gives me permission to do so. So at the end of the day, I want him to have control of this. Now come back to what we've got here. So Paul says to the young man, Timothy, there's a time coming. Folks, aren't, they're not going to be interested in sound doctrine. Instead, what they're going to want is they're going to want to gather themselves the teachers that make them feel good. They itch their ears. Oh, yeah, I like hearing that stuff. Now apply it to the little bit of the diagram there. Two out of the three legs on that stool of authority that you have for the Catholic Church, two out of the three legs come about because of itching ears. They're there. Far left because of the hierarchy of the church. Far right because of whatever the church comes up with, the traditions that they have. You see how Catholicism itself is the living example of the fulfillment of the prophetic words of 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 3. I, uh, I, I broke open my catechism book uh, that I was, was given, and uh, I was reading through it the other day, and, and just looking to it, and then I decided to make this meme, you see it there in the bottom right, that's actually laying there on top of a Bible. I just want you to notice, how, look at this thing. Uh, let me get it over here where you can see it. I mean... It's and, and inside, and that's fine print. I got to watch my directions. That's fine print in there, you know. And that's a one. That's one massive collection of man stuff, man's words. 
And of course, they'll explain that this book is necessary for us to understand what God said. Okay, And so they would probably even parallel it to a com commentary. It's not. Uh, this is less of a less of a commentary, more of a creed. Uh, the, these are these are the things that the the church has decided are binding upon the church, not explanations of what somebody thinks a passage might happen to mean. I mean, it's just a huge book, uh, you know. I, and I, I'm kind of appalled when I look at this and I and I recognize how much effort they have gone through to make sure they can explain away certain passages within Scripture. My question is, what would happen if we would just let God talk? And then, here's part number two that you're going to need to watch second after this, this one. What would happen if we let God, after he has spoken, then we went to God and said, God, would you explain what you just said to us? That would be really cool. That would be interesting. And that's exactly what we need to do. But it's certainly not what the Catholic Church has done. The Catholic Church said, you can't understand it. So let us make up this big old fat m manual here to, to tell you what God actually says, because you can't understand it. See, you see the point? The time's coming. I say it's now. It's right now. And the Catholic Church is a living illustration of those who have gathered to themselves teachers to suit their own passions. I again take you to that diagram. Two out of the three legs of that stool are there to tickle your ears, to itch your ears, to make you feel good about yourself, to let man have his opinion. Only one of them is the sacred scripture. And that's a problem. That's a problem. I want to remind you of their excuse that they often use with regards to church tradition, that one there on in the diagram there on, on the right. 2 Thessalonians 2, 14 through 15. Uh, to this, he, is, he called you through our gospel so that you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brothers, stand firm and hold to the traditions. There you go. Catholic Church says hold to the traditions. So 2 Thessalonians 2, 14 through 15 gives us permission to make up traditions and then establish those traditions as law within the church function. And, of course, they would connect that again, go back, to pedal backwards to other lessons in this series. They would connect that then to Peter being given the right to bind on earth that which would also be bound in heaven. Loose on earth that which would also be loosed in heaven. The thing they don't want you to know is that that's chapter 16 of the book, Matthew. The thing they don't want you to know is two chapters later in chapter 18, the Lord provides the same authority to all the audience that's listening there. It didn't just go to Peter, okay? And I suggest to you, if you study that in detail, you'll find out that who he's giving permission to are the inspired writers of the first century so that they can be putting the words down in Scripture, and then now you and I, 2,000 years later, can use those Scripture as our authority, not the supposed apostolic succession. But come back to our passage one last time, and, and remember it. And remember that in this passage, he says several things that are very important to this idea of hold to the traditions. They take that phrase, they run off with it, saying that gives us permission in the church to make up traditions. No, I don't. Because you drew a phrase out of Scripture and didn't let God explain himself. Hold to the traditions, continue watching. That you were taught by who? The inspired writers wrote down the traditions. Those then become binding upon the church. He goes on to say, taught by us either by our spoken word or by our letter. So, number two, it's not just that the traditions have to be the traditions that the inspired writers gave us, but they are the traditions that the inspired writers taught, either by word or by writing it down. He's very specific in this passage. He doesn't do what the Catholic Church would suggest and just open it up wide to say, hey, looky here. You guys, we can make up anything that we want as we go along. As long as it's got the church's seal of approval on it, we can make it into law. That's not what 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 is saying. So, number one, the traditions he's referring to are things that were taught by the inspired writers. They are things that were spoken or written down by the inspired writers. And then number three, got to go backwards in the passage just a little bit, but notice that he claims it is their gospel. So this, he at the very front end, to this he called you through our gospel. It's specifically the gospel that was presented by the apostles, the other inspired writers of the first century. 
once the Bible was completed and it was written down and collected, and that process, by the way, began long, long before there ever was the invention of the, of the, the Catholic Church. That process began in the first century. Once the Bible's completed, not only is the apostolic succession done, but we've got exactly what we need to understand all the regulations, laws, uh, advice, uh, standards for the church. We don't have to go to some pope in a silly hat to find out. We go to the book. Go straight to the Bible. Let God speak. So once again, in this passage, we see a passage that they brutally abuse to suggest that they can make stuff up as they go, which doesn't say that at all. It clearly is talking about the things that the inspired men of the first century said or wrote down. Well, that leads us then to this new material. I'm often told by Catholics when I debate them, you know, the Bible never says that it's the sole authority, Sonny. And you can see my response. Um, I've got a few passages here. We could go into others, but right now I'm just going to pick these apart. The 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 is another passage that I've used in the past, but they, they like to twist this one too. They, they do the thing, they're a lot like what Satan did in the garden with Eve when he spoke a half-truth to her. And he, he deceived her into doing the wrong thing by giving her just a tidbit of accuracy, but not the whole thing. Well, they do the same thing with passages such as 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 through 17. They, when you see the opening phrase there, all scripture, they'll immediately stop you and they'll say, Sonny, that's talking about the Old Testament. This does not apply to the New Testament. That's talking about the Old Testament stuff. I would, of course, respond, well, even if that's the case, what is he doing giving it to a New Testament evangelist, Timothy, as standards by which he must govern himself. Second thing I would say to you is, if he is referring, when he says all Scripture, if he's only referring to the Old Testament, then that means that only the Old Testament is necessary to give us, thoroughly furnish us, notice the following, the phrase down at the bottom, only the Old Testament, that's all we need to thoroughly furnish us unto all good works. When clearly... We are told that Jesus came to fulfill the old law, that he came to give us a new law, etc. And so what we have really and truly, you see it in yellow there, the arrow pointing it down there to the far uh, left-hand corner. What we have here, when he says all scripture, I'm convinced he is not talking about just the Old Testament past. He's also talking about the present. When he writes to Timothy, at that time he is saying, what is being written to you, inspired words that are being given to you, he says, these scriptures are also profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness, etc. Okay? Then he's clearly also talking about future, because Paul's going to die earlier in the first century. We're going to have folks like John and others who are going to last later on. Into, and so he's evidently even referring to future scripture that would be coming after he's gone, written by individuals who were inspired men of the first century. But now take the passage and go back and notice what he's saying here. If the Bible never says it's the sole authority, yet the Bible itself says all Scripture is given to thoroughly furnish us. Up, furnish us. Sounds like it's saying that it's the sole authority to me. How about you? Come on down here to Matthew 15, 9. In vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. I want you to notice the connection between the commandments of men and vanity. He says they are worshiping in vain. Vain means empty without value. So their worship is, as we often say, it doesn't get any higher in the ceiling. So it has no value. Why? Because they are teaching the doctrines of men as if they were commandments. So, back to our point. If the Bible never says it's the sole authority, yet the Bible says that if you teach anything other than what God has inspired, the doctrines of men, your worship is vain, I got a problem. You know what I'm saying? 1 Corinthians 4, 6 is really interesting. I have applied all these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit. Brothers, that you may learn by us not to go beyond what is written, that none of you may be puffed up in favor of one, uh, one against another. A lot of debate as to what this particular passage means, but it does seem to me that as you look at what is what Paul already said in 2 Timothy 3.16, etc. 
Matthew 15, 9, what Jesus himself would say, it does seem to me that what he is saying is that God is going to depend upon men to write down. They're going to communicate by writing things down. And that written text is going to become, it's going to become the parameters that you don't go beyond. Don't be making stuff up for God. Don't be going around suggesting that I can speak for God in his place. No. You are to take God's words and allow God's words to not only speak, but God's word to explain God's word. That's why I so in the Restoration School of Biblical Studies, one of my favorite phrases is we're going to let the Bible interpret the Bible. God's word interpreting God's word. And next time, next lesson is going to be all about that. So I really hope you'll be with us. Notice what Jude says. There's only one chapter. That's why you got the, that's verse three. Uh, beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, he said, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. Whatever he's referring to there, we can see that he says it's once delivered. I think that by implication we can draw the conclusion then that it doesn't have to be further delivered by the Catholic Church. There are no addendums, there's no supplements, there's no need for the Pope to sit in his funny hat in his long dress and make up stuff. We stick with what God says, and as we stick with what God says, at the end of the day, we're going to have what God says. And so it was once, once delivered for all the saints. Once it's delivered, it's once delivered. It's done. And we don't need the Catholic Church to spend 2,000 years trying to explain what they think it should have meant. I shouldn't even give them two. They haven't been around 2,000 years. They want to claim they've been around 2,000 years. But the apostasy of the Catholic Church has not been around since the beginning of the church, believe me. Okay. Last passage then I want to deal with, and then uh, we'll, we'll take a break, and then next time we'll have this next lesson, which I think you're going to find very intriguing with regards to you can study the Bible on your own. Yeah, Catholics, listen to this. Yeah, you can read it on your own, and in the process, you can seek God's counsel, God's commentary on his own word you got to be here next time. One of the most important lessons we're going to cover in this entire series. But before we end tonight, Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 through 10. I am astonished, Paul says to the Galatians. I'm astonished that you're so quickly deserting him who called you uh, in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we, so if Paul were to come in and say, I got an addendum, I've got a supplement, I've got a different gospel, he says, no. Nah. Even if we, or, let's take another level, what if an angel from heaven shows up and says, I have a gospel. Maybe we'll do a, a, a series in, in the future about John Smith and his believing that an angel had came and, and given him a, 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 a supplement to our Bible. Maybe, we, maybe we'll do that someday, but right now we're dealing with the Catholicism. But he says, even if an angel shows up and he says, I've got a, a supplement, something to add to the gospel, a different gospel. He said, don't you, don't you dare. He says, if they do that, distorting the gospel of Christ, he says, verse 8, if they preach that gospel contrary to the one we preach you, let him be accursed. Then in verse 9, he says, as we've said before, now I say again, if anyone's preached you a different gospel contrary, you should let him be accursed. You can always count on something with scripture, and that is when God repeats it, it means it's significant. That's going to, by the way, play in really big next time in our lesson. When God repeats it, you can take that to the bank. That really means something to God. And you'll notice that he doesn't just repeat it here, verses 8 and 9. He repeats it in close proximity to one another. Paul, inspired by God, says, anybody who presents a different gospel is accursed. And just in case you didn't get it, verse 9, let me say it to you again. Anybody who presents a different gospel than what we've already, he, he's accursed. Even if it's an angel from heaven, he's accursed. Now, how does that apply then? Well, go back to your that little, let's see if I can do it right there. You see the, the little diagram? The authority of the Christian or the Catholic Church, it, 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 two of the three legs depend upon human authority. Accursed. But there's a part of Galatians chapter 1 that we so often skip over with relationship to this context. So I think it's very, very important. Notice he goes on then to conclude in verse 10, for I am now, for am I now seeking approval of man or of God? Paul's asking, 
to the Galatians. He, he said, I'm shocked that you're, you're walking away from, from the gospel. And then he says, kind of a redundant question, you know, wait, you think I'm seeking the approval of man? Or am I trying to please man? Then he makes this conclusion, which is just right in the face of Catholicism. If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. If I'm all about pleasing man, looking to man, two of the three legs on my stool have to do with man, I'm not pleasing Jesus. In fact, I'm not a servant of Christ. Could I say it this way? If I were still trying to please man, I would be an antichrist. Because I'm not a servant of Christ. Because I'm most interested in getting the accolades of men. I want to know what the, what the Pope so-and-so had to say on that particular subject. I'm going to go talk to my priest, my bishop. I'm going to ask, you know, one of the cardinals of the, of the Catholic Church. If I'm all about that, the accolades of men, getting the approval of men, I'm not about getting the approval of God. I want to say this in, in, with regards to this series. You might have noticed that some of the Catholics have really dropped off since we've begun this. And one of the reasons for that is because once you finally press them, into understanding that the scripture, God's enough. God is enough. And we let him speak for himself. When you finally, they don't have any place to go. And so they will either, and they did there, as you might, you probably saw for several of those lessons, uh, that they go into throwing profanities and, you know, throwing hissy fits and making themselves look like third graders. But eventually they just walk away because they're not willing to submit to God. They are so dependent on the mechanism of the Catholic Church that they refuse to depend upon the relationship with the Creator Himself. If I'm seeking the approval of man, he says, then I'm not seeking the approval of Christ. I'm not a servant of Jesus. I'm the Antichrist walking. Do not trust the Catholic hierarchy because they are going to, much like Satan did in the garden, they're going to do everything they can to twist and turn and Give it a, a counter explanation to what God actually said. That's why you got a book this thick to explain the Bible because they're doing what Satan did in the garden. That's why the Antichrist doctrine of Catholicism has to be exposed, and that's what this 16 week series is all about. There is where we're going next week. Tonight, we talked about trusting God. A lot of us like to give verbiage in admiration to that concept. Even Catholics do that. A lot of Reformationists do that. They'll, they'll say that, yes, I trust in God. And then they turn right around, they want, they want to quote some Reformation leader. Or if you're a Catholic, they turn right around, they want to quote some Pope or Church Father or whatever it may be. I want to suggest to you that if you can't take part two along with part one, part one isn't accurate at all in your life. You can say all day long, I trust God, but until you trust him to explain himself, you don't trust him. You don't trust him. And so next time, I pray that you'll join me because we're going to look at what I think is not only obvious and convincing in information with regards to how God explains himself in Scripture, but you're going to find a breath of great fresh air. It's not unlike what happened when many of those individuals under the heavy thumb of Catholicism, when they were persecuting people who were wanting to translate the Bible into the language of the common man, and they were burning people at the stake, and they were chasing people down who were uh, not teaching what the, that particular church leader wanted them to teach. You're going to, you're going to find that much like those folks were set free by the opportunity to study the Bible on their own. You're telling me I can sit under a tree with the Bible in my lap and me and God can figure it out? Absolutely! And I'm telling you, folks, when you get there, life opens up. Christianity becomes such a wonderful adventure. That's next time. You're going to want to be with me. Here are the five questions that we are dealing with in this lesson. And uh, you'll receive, if you're part of the School of Biblical Studies, you'll receive that at the end of the week. So I am so thankful that you have been joining me with this series. It's been very 
Uh, we've had a lot of, lot, a lot of viewers. Thousands of folks have been wa watching the series from around the world, and that uh, it just really means a lot to me that when I spend so much time putting this stuff together, praying and asking the Lord for insight and those kind of things, that, that folks respond. You're one of them. I love you, and I thank you. Sonny Chow saying, be there. Matthew 16, 26.